Greetings, everyone. Uh, Kevin Morris here with the Federal Aviation Administration, broadcasting live from Minnesota this time for episode number three of our summer webinar series titled Just the Facts. As usual, we're presenting through Adobe Connect, and I want to go through just a few reminders with you folks. Some of the basics here, the audio is going to be through your computer speaker, so make sure you have that adjusted properly. At the bottom of the screen, you're going to see what we call the Q&A pod. And that's where you're able to type in your questions throughout the presentation and have it answered by FAA UAS experts. General questions are always best in the Q&A pod. However, if you do have a specific question, please feel free to ask it there and we'll get an answer to you. Maybe not today, but very quickly after that. We will be posting all of the questions in the Q&A pod to our website, which we'll have later here in the presentation. Final reminder that the presentation is being recorded. In fact, the previous pre, uh, two presentations are live now on YouTube, and you can access them quickly by going to our website, www.fa.gov forward slash go forward slash waiver. Moving through, who are we? We're the Federal Aviation Administration, the Flight Standards Division. Specifically, who you have access to today are a dedicated group of UAS experts. We have representatives from the Air Traffic Organization, from the waiver team who do the actual review of the waivers. We have Airman Certification Standards folks here, and we also have FAA legal representation here in the room too. So any questions that you may have that fall into any of those categories or any other that are related to unmanned aircraft systems, now would be a great chance for you to ask them during this next hour because you'll have expert advice coming back to you from the other side. We want to make sure that everyone is operating UAS safely in the national airspace system. That has always been one of our goals. So as most of you know, if you've attended before how this works, this is part of an ongoing digital workshop series. So this is not meant to be just a standalone presentation, but yet one of some in a series to help you with your waiver applications. As I mentioned earlier, it's a great way for you to have your questions asked directly to FAA experts and then have them answered by those experts. We will be posting this video as well as all the other ones later through our website uh, in the presentation later on. We're starting with the known hot topic, operational waivers. We have a lot of requests for information on this, so we wanted to reach out to you folks to help you through this process. In the future, we plan to change the role of the presentations and the subject matter dictated on your response and feedback from us. So if you do have a suggestion of what you'd like to see covered, please put that into the Q&A pod at the bottom of the screen as well, because the more information we get back from you folks, the better we are able to help you out with getting you the information that you need. So what is our objective as a whole? We want to make sure that our national airspace system stays as safe as possible. And through that educational outreach that we're doing with this webinar series, we're trying to reach that goal as well. In an attempt to help you understand also what the process is that we're using for UIS operations, in particular waivers. And then in the end, we want to open up more dialogue with you folks in industry. We want to have better communications with you folks out in the field. So this is one of the ways that we are doing that. So I hope you folks are enjoying the summer webinar series. Our goal today with Just the Facts is trying to help you understand that the quality of data you submit in your waiver application is actually as important as how much data you're submitting. So we're going to walk through some few examples today and give you some help with understanding what we need to see from you in a waiver application in terms of factual data. And this will help you move your data in your applications beyond the what and into the how. More on that later. And always, we're here to answer your questions. So please utilize that Q&A pod at the, at the bottom of the screen. We will have a live Q&A that follows this presentation as well. So today, we want to help you, the waiver applicant, understand what data you need to include in your waiver application to ensure a successful outcome. Our goal is to help you have a successful waiver application. It's better for everyone involved. So whatever we can do to help you folks out, that's what we're trying to do through this series and through answering your questions there at the bottom of the screen. Where we start with this information, where we start with just the facts, what do we need to see in your waiver application? We start with the waiver application instructions. That should be your starting point before actually starting the waiver application process. Read through the waiver application instructions. It's not a large document. I believe it's about two pages long but it's got some critical information in there. Quite frankly, a lot of the data mistakes that we see in waiver applications 
could be cleared by simply reading the waiver application instructions. Those instructions are available for free on our FAA dronezone.faa.gov website or the drone zone portal that most of you are familiar with, with registering your UAS, with submitting your waiver applications. In that document, in the waiver application instructions, it's going to clarify four key points. And I want to walk you through that here today to help you folks out. It's going to talk about what an operational title is, who the responsible person is or could be, the organization, meaning that you as an organization can use the drone zone portal to apply for a waiver. And then it talks also about the operation parameters. That's the, the where you want to do it and when you want to do the, the waiver operations. So let's start here with our operational title. The operational title of your waiver application could be anything that you choose. It's really a title to help you, the applicant, sort through if you have more than one waiver applications going on at the same time. For example, if you're going to be doing um, some filming on Main Street and this part of your waiver application for that particular event, you can title that one 1200 Main Street Photos. Or like it shows on the screen there, maybe you're doing some power line work and the waiver you're applying for is directly or specifically related to that operation for the power lines. Call it Shelbyville Power Lines. Again, the title of your waiver application is entirely up to you and is there to help you sort through waiver applications if you have more than one in the Drone Zone portal. Now let's get into probably one of the most important pieces of the waiver application process, the responsible person. When you start your waiver application process, you're going to need to list a responsible person. Now, Drone Zone will auto-populate that field if you've applied for a waiver before. So if this is not your first waiver application and you identified a responsible person in a previous waiver application, Drone Zone will actually auto-populate that for you. If you haven't ever applied, it will come straight off your account profile. So if you're not going to list an organization as part of your account ownership, it will just pull straight from your account profile. The important thing to remember when you're listing a responsible person is that the email address and the phone number are valid. It's extremely important because those two methods of communication, email and phone, are the only way that we have to reach out to the responsible person if we have a question or if an issue arises. So if you are applying for a waiver and you are listing yourself as a responsible person, Double check the email address, double check the phone number. Those are very important bits of information that we need. More on the responsible person. Remember, the responsible person is going to be responsible for the safety of all the operations and adherence to the waiver terms and provisions. They are the ones who will maintain all the records required by that waiver for your operation. There will also be the ones who have the responsibility to ensure that the remote pilot and command and the visual observer, if you do use one, are accessible, informed, and comply with Part 107. So in short, the responsible person is the focal point for that waiver and operation. The buck stops with them, so to speak. The responsible person is a critical piece of your waiver operation. Now, the responsible person can be a representative of the organization. Um, they are going to be the point of contact for all matters related to the operation. Therefore, they must be, whoever that responsible person is, they must be aware of all operations being conducted under the terms of that waiver. They are going to be the ones that maintain the list of authorized remote pilots who can utilize that waiver and maintain the list of uh, the UAS that are authorized to be flown under the terms and conditions of that waiver. So the responsible person is a key component. Now, I mentioned organization. And if you've watched some of our previous webinars, you've heard me say that Drone Zone, our portal, can be organization specific, meaning you can apply as your company or your organization for a waiver application. So how that's done is you set up an account with Drone Zone, and in the profile section of your account, there is an entry field titled Part 107 Account Name. That's where you will put in your organizational name. That's where you can set that up. So at that point, then, the Drone Zone portal account becomes organization specific. As an organization, you may have multiple account managers tied into that Drone Zone portal account. 
meaning that if you have four people that you want to have access to that drone zone account or have the ability to apply for a waiver on behalf of that organization, you can set that up in the drone zone account. Multiple account managers can be set up. The owner of the drone zone account would then deem how much administrative privileges those other account managers have. But remember, if you have four or five account managers for your organization's drone zone account, one has to be listed as a responsible person. Even though you're applying for an organizational owned waiver, so to speak, there still needs to be a responsible person listed. The benefit of applying as an organization through Drone Zone is that you can change the responsible person. And it's a very simple process. As you see on the screen there, if you are applying for a waiver as an organization, let's say you've been granted a daylight waiver, so you're going to be doing night operations as an organization, and John Doe is your responsible person. If you wanted to change that to Jane Doe, you would simply submit another authorization, uh, excuse me, another waiver application indicating that the only change you are requesting is the responsible person to become Jane Doe. And you would, of course, list that new responsible person in that application. So to help us along, please include the previous waiver application authorization number for reference. That will really help expedite the process. So that is one of the benefits of applying as an organization with responsible person because you can change it. Because remember, and this is very, very important, waivers are non-transferable. You cannot give your waiver to somebody else and have them own it. You may not sell your waiver to somebody else and have them own it. They are non-transferable. So if you're applying for a waiver as an organization, the waiver is going to be issued to the organization with the responsible person in charge of it. And as I just mentioned, we can change the responsible person in that waiver application process. If you're applying as an individual, if Kevin Morris were to apply for a drone waiver and I wanted to say fly at night, so I want my daylight waiver, I'm not a company, I'm just Kevin Morris, one guy, that waiver will be issued to me. I cannot change that responsible person because I am an individual, I am not an organization. So because waivers are not transferable, I can't borrow somebody else's, I can't give mine to somebody else, they have to stay with the individual. So depending on your own needs for your operation, for your missions, you may want to apply as an individual or you may want to apply as an organization. One of the things also addressed in the waiver application instructions are the operational parameters. This is the when do you want to fly and where do you want to fly portion of your waiver application. As we've said over and over again, we request that you apply for your operational waiver at least 90 days in advance. That gives us plenty of time to review it, even if it's a slightly more complex waiver than the majority that we're seeing. 90 days is the time that we request it. As you may have seen in other presentations, operational waivers on average take about 30 days to process. So just because we say pl please apply 90 days in advance for your operational waiver doesn't mean it's going to take 90 days. But that would assure you enough time to work with us through the process if we had, for example, a request for information, which we'll talk about later, and allow you to have that waiver reviewed and hopefully approved so that you can start your operation on time. Now with the proposed location, that's really up to you on how you want to put that information in there. You can put that in as a center GPS point with a radius. You can build a polygon shape with GPS points, or you can be a little bit more broad. You can say, I, I'd like this for class G airspace, or I'd like this for the continental United States. And depending on the waiver you're applying for, will determine where that waiver application uh, approval would be good for. So if you only need it for a specific location, that's what you'd want to put. But if you do want to be able to operate in, in all class G airspace, if that's who your request, then you'd want to put that in there. But you can be as specific or as broad as you want in that waiver application request. As we've said many, many, many times, when you're applying for a waiver, after you've gone through the waiver application instructions, you really need to be familiar with the waiver safety explanation guidelines. This is your help, your tool, your guidance to get through a waiver application process to at least start you off on the right foot. It's a step-by-step -step process that we outline. And if you've read through it, you've seen this. Just, it's just a lot of questions. But the questions are designed to really help you get the right data, the factual data, 
into your waiver application because that is key. Remember, quality is just as important as quantity, and in some cases, maybe even more so. So please utilize the waiver safety explanation guidelines. They're going to help you with what we call CONOPS. That's your concept of operations. That helps you with the why do you need to do this? Where do you want to do it? Who is going to do this? What type of equipment are you going to use? It's going to really walk you through the justification piece in making your safety case. So if you want to fly during the night, that's great, but you need to explain to us why. And the CONOP section of the waiver safety explanation guidelines will help you through that process. It will also help you through the, the uh, nuances of the operational risks and mitigations specific to the rule you're requesting waiver relief from. So for example, daylight operation. One of the questions, and this was pulled straight out of the waiver safety explanation guidelines, you want to fly at night. One of the things that we want to know is how will the remote PIC avoid hitting things at night? What's your process for that? How are you going to identify hazards? How are you going to assess the risk and mitigate that down? And this is critically important because if you look at the bottom of the slide that's on the screen now, in that box area that says important, it clearly tells you that if we can't find hazard identification and risk mitigation strategies in your waiver application, we cannot do a complete safety analysis, and therefore the waiver application will be denied. You remember what I said at the beginning of our presentation today, we don't want your waiver applications denied. We want to help you with a successful waiver application, and a huge component of that is the waiver application instructions that we just talked about, and the waiver safety explanation guidelines, which will walk you through the individual process. One key tip is to remember to only apply for what you need. Your waiver application is not the first salvo in a negotiating process. It's not your opening bid with the FAA. So don't ask for the stars, the sun, and the moon in your waiver application because we will take that as you're asking for the stars, the sun, and the moon, and it may get denied. So please only apply for what you need. Again, that waiver application must be very specific. It must be very factual. It must contain the information identified in the waiver application instructions and the waiver safety explanation guidelines. So once you've got exactly what you need, submit your waiver only when it's 100% complete. That's the other takeaway from this slide. Please don't submit an incomplete waiver thinking you've got time to go and add and modify down the line. Because remember, once we get a waiver, we start the review process, and if it's missing all sorts of data, it's going to be denied. So please only submit your waiver applications once 100% of the factual data that you need to be in there is in your waiver application. Throughout the process of your waiver application, you may receive a request for information. So once you put all the information in there, you've addressed the WSEG, the waiver safety explanation guideline questions, you click submit. Once it starts to be reviewed by an FAA analyst, they may need to get a little bit more information from you. We call that an RFI or request for information. It's our mechanism to get us more information about your waiver application. If you receive one of these requests for informations, please respond promptly. One of the biggest delays that we tend to see are we sending, uh, is the FAA sending out a request for information and then we wait and we wait and we wait and we don't hear anything back. So please respond promptly if you receive an RFI. Don't wait until the last minute. Again, we're trying to work with you on that waiver application as close to real time as we can and we need your cooperation on your end to get us that information maybe that we're missing from your application. We talk a lot about quantity, we talk a lot about quality, so let's get a little bit more specific into what I mean by that. We're all familiar with step two of the waiver application process where there is a box and it has a 15,000 character limit, or in step four you can add uh, up to five attachments of 20 megabytes each. It doesn't do you any good if we're adding five 600 page documents, but they're not addressing the quality information that we need to see. So for example, if you submit a huge manual, but that manual doesn't identify hazards, or doesn't assess risk, or you're not providing mitigation strategies, it doesn't matter that there's 500 pages in that manual, because the information that we need is not there. The quality of that information is not missing. So when you're submitting an application, remember quality is very, very important. We need to see hazard identification. We need to see you assess the risk 
of your proposed operation. And then finally, we need to see what mitigation strategies you're employing. And if that seems like I just spoke a foreign language, episode two, again, which is up on YouTube and it's up on our website, is available and it deals specifically with those key three bullet points on the bottom of that screen. That's probably one of the most critical episodes we've had so far. It's entitled Risky Business. I highly recommend watching that. So if you are going to submit a manual, and I've mentioned this before, but it bears repeating, please include references to where the data is. So the quality data that you're submitting in, let's say, that 500-page manual or 100-page manual, please let us know where it is. Because the, the idea is we want to try to work through your waiver application as quickly as possible, ensuring that you're going to do a safe flight. And to help us out with that is bookmarks. For example, while you're addressing all the waiver safety explanation guideline questions, make bookmarks if you're uploading a large document and show us where those questions are answered. If there's other key components to your application because it's slightly more complex than others, make sure you include documentation and bookmarks to where that information is. All that will help expedite the process of the processing of your waiver application. Finally, one of the things that we see a lot of is assumptions being made. Please do not assume we know what you mean or don't assume we know who you are. You, you cannot leave things to what a lot of people refer to as common sense in your waiver application. When you submit that waiver application, it doesn't tell us who you are. It doesn't tell us how many years you've been flying UAS or how safe you operate or all the things that you do or all the processes that your business follows to ensure a safe operation. It's a waiver application. And the only information we have on what you want to do and how you're going to do it is contained in that application. So don't leave anything to chance. Don't assume we just know what you're intending to do because we need to have that spelled out for us. Again, that documentation is the only way we know who you are. So what I want to do here is put up a, a couple examples. And this is somewhat typical of what we may see um, with daylight waiver applications. For example, we have an applicant, one, who is an airline pilot, very familiar with the FAA. He's been flying UAS for 10 years, got his remote pilot certificate the day it was issued. He's really up to speed on everything. The other applicant is right out of high school. He's got two months of flying his drone. Both of these individuals are going to apply for a daylight waiver. Both of these individuals want to fly at night. Now, the airline pilot, very familiar with aviation, been flying their entire career. So he doesn't put in his waiver application that they're going to, he's going to scan the skies for traffic or utilize visual observers before night because he feels that's just common sense, right? Of course I'm going to look up in the sky before I fly. Of course my visual observers are going to scan for traffic around my area and let me know if I see something. So why would I put that in my application? That's just obvious. So he doesn't. The high school senior puts in a very detailed quality data into his application saying, I'm going to use VOs. They're, here's how they're going to methodically scan the skies for traffic. Here's how they're going to communicate with me. Here's my plan if we do spot traffic. All this happens during night operations, and we are going to follow this every single time we go out. I'm going to ensure everybody's trained. So we get both applications, and it's probably no surprise to you at this point what happens. The airline pilot, the, the aviation expert, so to speak, their application is denied. But that kid that's only been flying for two months, UAS, they just get approved. And the reason is because they clearly identified everything that they want to do. They didn't leave things open to assumption. They didn't leave things open to, well, I'm not going to put that in there because that's just common sense. So remember, we don't know who you are. So we can't make assumptions about you, what you would or would not do. The quality of what you're submitting, that data that you're putting in your waiver application, is our only indicator of how you're going to operate. Therefore, it has to be thorough, it has to be a very good quality, and it has to be very factual. One of the other things we tend to see a lot is copy-paste. And in this situation, imitation is not the most sincere form of flattery. When you're applying for a waiver, please do not copy somebody else's waiver application and paste it into your waiver application and submit it. You may think like, well, they got it, putting this in there, so I'm going to put it in there. But remember, each individual is different. Each UAS you intend to fly is different. Each area of operation you want to fly is different. And if you think you're sort of fooling the FAA by doing a copy-paste, 
Think back to the high school days. Did you ever fool a teacher by copying somebody else's book report? Probably not. And it's the same thing for us. And we see that come in waves. So somebody will get an application approved, and then we'll see another 15 or 20 applications that are identical word for word. And the problems that come up is that the mitigations included may not be specific to your operation. And in some cases, the names of things aren't even changed. So we'll get 15 waiver applications, and they have the exact same people named in it or the exact same buildings for reference named in it, and it doesn't make any sense with where you're intending to operate. So what I'm getting at is submit your waiver application on your own. You can certainly look at somebody else's if you feel that they had some good ideas and incorporate that into your waiver application, but your applications need to be individualized. We can't do the copy and paste because they contain the errors, the mitigations aren't specific, and we know that this isn't really what you're going to do per se because you just copied the other one that 15 other people did. One of the things also that cause problems, we get a lot of the what people are going to do, but we don't get the how. And so I kind of call this the what versus how. So what, what's the action or equipment that you're going to take or use while operating under the, the waiver? The how is the method, the methodology of what the action is going to do or how the equipment is going to work. So in waiver applications, we get a lot of the what, but a lot of times we're missing the how. And so let me expand on that a little bit. So we'll get this statement, something like this in a, a waiver application. The visual observer will notify the remote pilot of any hazards. Great. How are they going to do that? Is it via cell phone? Are they going to shout? Is it via two-way radio communications? Um, how will that VO ensure that the remote pilot in command who's operating that UAS is aware of an impending threat or a hazard that they didn't plan on? So it's great that they're going to do it, but we need to know the how. How are they going to do it? Another example here. Uh, generally speaking, we get something like, my UAS will be equipped with lights for operating at night. Great. We, we definitely want to see that your UAS has lights on it. But how do those lights work? Um, so if you look at the last bullet point on there, it's an example of what you can say in a waiver application for telling us how these things work. They're manufactured by here. They've tested them. They have a visibility of at least so many miles. They're color coded. That way I can simply look at my UAS and without even looking at my telemetry data on my control station, I know what direction is pointed. I know what direction is flying. Again, we see a lot of the what, but not enough of the how. So in that quality data application, the facts that you're submitting with your waiver application, please include the how along with the what. So wrapping up here today, the top three tips we want you to take away is make sure that you're clearly identifying the hazards. The waiver safety explanation guidelines will help with that. Provide complete safety mitigations. Don't make assumptions. Don't leave things out to common sense because, geez, everybody understands that. Make sure you're very specific in your waiver application. Those three elements will really help you along. Again, please review the previous webinar series that we've had out there on waiver application, Where's My Waiver and Risky Business, along with this one. They're designed to help walk you through the process so that you can get an approval for the waiver that you're seeking. Their information that we have available to you uh, is on our website as usual at www.fa.gov forward slash UAS. The drone zone documents that I mentioned, the waiver safety explanation guidelines, the waiver application instructions, those are available on faadronezone.faa.gov. This entire summer webinar series is available on www.faa.gov forward slash go forward slash waiver. In addition to being able to access the previous recordings, including this one, you'll have access to our FAQs, you'll have access to the questions that have been posted during today's live webinar, as well as the previous two ones that we've done, and supporting documents. So any of the documents that we mention or reference, for example, the Risk Management Handbook, you'll find all that information on our website there, fa.gov forward slash go forward slash waiver. Coming up here in a couple of weeks uh, was going to be, I believe, one of our most popular uh, webinar series of the summer. It's going to be done in two parts. It's called The Dark Night. That will drill down and specifically focus on daylight waiver applications. We'll go through the entire waiver safety explanation guideline process for those types of waivers to really help you folks out because those by far are the most requested waivers that we receive here at the FAA. We'll follow that up with the good, bad, the ugly, where we talk specifically about some of the waiver applications that we've seen, what's good, what's not, what's working, and, and quite frankly, what doesn't. And then we're going to talk beyond visual line of sight, 
altitude operating limitations, and we'll wrap up with operations over people.